a colleague and a member of the ENT department at the university. He's going to give us sort of our annual update on chronic sinusitis um, or whatever the proper terminology is in today's world uh, as viewed uh, from a surgical ENT perspective. So Ian, thank you for getting up early. Uh, go ahead. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Len. I really appreciate uh, the invitation to be here. And it's always a pleasure and an honor to be with this group. You know, one of the greatest joys of this profession is sharing patients uh, with your group. It's what keeps it interesting and worthwhile at the same time. So thank you again for the invitation to be here. I look forward to sharing a little bit more about uh, this newer described entity of nasal polyps. And uh, so what we're going to call it central compartment atopic disease, new views on an old problem. Why I called it that is central compartment disease is not new and part of the human experience, but uh, it was, uh, a phenotypic label or name was put to this in 2017, 2018, and we're learning more about it. And although it may not be as sophisticated or challenging or complex as some of our eosinophilic driven disease patients or our ARD patients, this is something that we probably see with much more regularity and uh, therefore is uh, gonna be familiar to our practices and something that we commonly encounter. Right. So that's what I wanna kind of aim to talk about today is this condition and uh, hopefully leave you with a little better understanding of how it's important to our practices. So a few of the objectives were to recognize that this seems to be a new phenotype of chronic sinusitis. And uh, although it's not a new condition, we're describing it in a different way that hopefully uh, I can leave you with some importance and relevance to your clinical practice. Uh, the, the endotype uh, has specific mechanisms behind it, and I'll share with, what, with you what we know today. And then there's much more that we certainly don't know and are currently learning. And lastly, we try to put it all together and kind of talk about how do we evaluate these patients um, in our everyday clinical practice. And so where this really all began, sorry. Apologize, I'm having a tech problem here. There we go. So where this began is the observations that we were challenged by the recognition that chronic sinusitis can present in a variety of different ways, both symptomatically and in the parameters which we use to define it. And for us, particularly as otolaryngologists, we stay centered and nested within three main parameters or data points, the history, our endoscopy findings, and our imaging. And really what it comes back to is the original kind of description of chronic sinusitis and then the first clinical practice guidelines were, were nested within symptoms. However, we you know, quickly realized that that was imperfect and problematic. And so additional metrics were added to the diagnostic criteria for chronic sinusitis, adding objective measures such as endoscopy and imaging. But the dilemma is that many times patients can have overlapping presentations even within those data points. And we're familiar with, you know, patients in the, in the top row here that, you know, do not have chronic sinusitis symptoms, but have asthma and perennial allergic rhinitis. I'd argue this is something that you see with regularity and we see much less commonly. But where we certainly share patients is the bottom row. And these are, you know, are probably our more severely affected patients uh, with polyp disease, high burdens of polyp disease, both endoscopically and on imaging. And then if you look at their quality of life metrics and indices, they have high disease uh, severity impacts in their quality of life. And if we look here in this next picture, the top row is the same patient we showed up on the previous slide, but on the same set of parameters, this patient would list in a very similar way. They both have chronic sinusitis. The, the top one has certainly higher rates or indices of uh, asthma. Uh, but they both can have perennial allergic rhinitis. And so this observation was appreciated, I think, for quite a while, but really wasn't advanced in terms of the research or science of, you know, why is it that a patient can otherwise have similar ICD-10 diagnostic criteria, but they certainly have different ways of presentation of their disease and their phenotype, and then the underlying mechanisms involved in their endotype of their condition. And so, you know, that really led to some uh, 
you know, very common observations probably that our groups both shared over time of why do some patients do better, some do worse with similar therapies. And it was, you know, really this pathway that it was a common treatment pathway with patients with chronic sinusitis, although they shared a similar diagnostic uh, code or, or, or condition that they were behaving much differently. And, and these were not new observations, but uh, consistent and so a group of researchers in, at Emory really started kind of putting a name to this newer phenotype uh, that uh, they coined the term central compartment atopic disease. And uh, that's what I hope to leave you with today is kind of an understanding of what they described, uh, recognizing that this is not new, uh, but it may be a new uh, title or a new uh, construct for us to think about this condition because it does appear to have important treatment implications uh, as well as uh, how we uh, advise these patients for outcomes and uh, long-term prognosis. So going back to some of the background again, it really comes back to some old questions that we've all wrestled with in our careers and continue to wrestle with, and that's really the associations of allergy and chronic sinusitis. And I say that both from the perspective of patients with polyps and without polyps. Numerous investigators around the world have tried to understand and better characterize these relationships. Uh, and, and to the extent possible, whether it's causation or correlation. And there's uh, unfortunately quite a bit of conflicting information surrounding this topic. And it probably speaks to the uh, underlying heterogeneity of the condition. But unfortunately, in many of the studies, chronic sinusitis is categorized as one single entity, but we know it's not one singular entity. And so I think there's probably some inherent uh, challenges and biases within the literature because of that original description of chronic sinusitis and subsequently uh, how this has affected our, our clinical research. And, you know, the, probably the best highest level evidence or guideline we have is uh, this summation. And you may have heard about this from our group or others uh, about uh, the international consensus statement on allergy and rhinology. And this is really a cornerstone of our uh, clinical practice um, recommendations. Uh, so it's, it's not a clinical practice guideline, but it's the best practices and summation of all the available evidence. And so this is a group, um, largely otolaryngologists and those identify as rhinologists, uh, but also allergists were included in this very large systematic analysis and critical appraisal and evidence-based review and recommendations of all of the available literature uh, surrounding these topics in chronic sinusitis. And, and I wanna just highlight the, the summative uh, recommendation or finding from this group surrounding the associations of allergy and chronic sinusitis. And I'll just fairly briefly read this uh, two sentences here, because I think it really summarizes what their findings were, is that, you know, for AR, there's a moderate level of evidence in acute rhinosinusitis. Uh, but in terms of recurrent acute rhinosinusitis and chronic sinusitis, both with and without polyps, the evidence does not support an association, although the evidence is highly conflicting. And so they go on to further say, further studies need to determine these associations between inhalant allergy and rhinosinusitis, as well as how in treating one process affects treating the other. And so I, that to me is a really a testament to what we've seen for decades and really trying to understand these paradigms of when we meet initially a patient with allergic rhinitis, asking ourselves, what is the likelihood or possibility or probability that they have chronic sinusitis and vice versa. And these patients probably come through our shared clinics in different ways. Uh, some may initially start with us as otolaryngologists and others uh, certainly start with primary care or uh, then get referred on to for allergy evaluation. So these, these patients are ones that we commonly see and look to us for advice of what do we do and how do we manage their condition. And when are patients that we you know escalate on for either further assessment, whether it's uh, endoscopy or otolaryngology evaluation, evaluation or even imaging. And it is likely that, you know, allergy has different roles in different subtypes of chronic sinusitis. But when you look at the data, unfortunately, many of those various subtypes of chronic sinusitis, at least as we have described currently, are uh, brought together into a single entity, which uh, we know is not how patients unfortunately behave or in their clinical trajectory. So it all began with an observation like many things in medicine. And this was a paper that was written in initially 2015 that identified that patients that otherwise had symptoms and stigmata of chronic sinusitis characteristically on their nasal endoscopy had very defined and localized polypoid edema into the middle medial space. Uh, 
And so on the photo that you see on the right of the screen, this is an endoscopy photo of a patient's nose. And what you'll see is uh, to the far left is the nasal septum. And then you'll see this kind of blistering swelling that's uh, right in the center of the photo. That's the middle turbid in a space that we really focus on called the middle meatus. And this is polypoid edema, maybe even low volume polyp disease right into that area. And the, you know, there are certain patients that will present with this manifestation very characteristically and, and frequently. But when you look elsewhere in the nose and other key spaces that we look at within the nasal cavity or other uh, meatal spaces beyond, we don't see objective evidence of inflammation. And so this was that their initial observation of, you know, this is something we see with regularity and overall their disease burden and impact seems to be low, but it's significant. And how do we navigate this? Because it seems to be behaving and manifesting differently than, for example, you know, an obvious example would be ARD or even uh, allergic fungal rhinosinusitis, so AFRS. And so that really inspired them to start kind of asking some critical questions about like, well, let's study this. And initially these were retrospective studies in 2017 and 2018 that really for the first time they coined this term central compartment atopic disease. And what they did is they went back and looked for patients with these very characteristic findings on their objective data points and then went deeper into their clinical history and allergy testing, et cetera. And uh, that therefore, you know, describe this phenotypic entity of chronic sinusitis. And in the bottom, what you'll see is a photo that's a representative coronal CT image of the paranasal sinuses. And uh, we'll go into this in greater depth le uh, later, but really what the important part of this is that the inflammation, the expression of the inflammation is within the central compartment. So let's define that and really kind of talk about what central compartment atopic disease is. And so this is how these authors defined it and have continued to find it over the intervening years. So what they initially identified was these very characteristic findings on their physical exam and initially their history. And when they started looking back in the retrospective uh, chart reviews, I noticed that you know, these patients had high rates of you know, uh, an inhalant allergy or aerial allergen sensitivities. Uh, and when they expressed this inflammation, uh, there was a, a very, characteristic and identifiable pattern where the patients were expressing inflammation, whether it was edema or even polyp or polypoid change. And these were you know, along that middle turbinate and middle medial space, the superior turbinate along the septum and even up within the F1 air cells themselves. And uh, they had a very characteristic radiographic distribution of disease as we alluded to, and we'll go in more depth uh, in a few moments. And so therefore they proposed this as a variant of chronic rhinosinusitis, a phenotypic variant of chronic rhinosinusitis. Uh, these studies did not have any mechanistic work. There was no uh, in-depth analysis of, you know, skin prick testing, serum testing, uh, local inhalant allergy within the nose. There was no mucus sampling. Uh, so there, there are significant limitations uh, to these data. However, they really showed for the first time in, in a more, a rigorous way than we had other than observations that there may be something to this as a distinct entity of chronic sinusitis, which may influence how we think about these patients, both in our diagnostic assessment, but also treatments. So they defined the diagnostic criteria fairly loosely, and these patients had bothersome CRS symptoms. And as you recall, we, we track four main symptoms for chronic sinusitis as part of our diagnostic criteria. There are others, but we use four, and we use nasal obstruction, discolored rhinorrhea, facial pressure pain, and altered sense of smell or taste. And to meet the diagnostic criteria for chronic sinusitis, you only need two of those four symptoms. The symptoms do need to be present daily for at least 90 days. And of the symptoms, one of them needs to be either discolored discharge or um, uh, nasal obstruction. So nasal obstruction is very common with patients with any variety of rhinitis and sinusitis symptoms. The rhinorrhea it can be a little bit more problematic uh, for determining that because there's a qualifier, meaning it has to be discolored rhinorrhea. And, and in my experience, most patients, when you ask if, they're, if their nasal mucus is discolored, almost universally, most patients will say, oh, it's always yellow or it's whitish. Uh, there are some that you know will describe it as clear only for sure, uh, but many patients that are gonna land in our clinics often uh, are gonna describe it as discolored. So those are the, the main symptoms we track. But again, recall that objective evidence of inflammation is necessary to confirm the diagnosis or qualify for the diagnosis of chronic sinusitis. And so this is where characteristic endoscopy and imaging findings are important. And I'll show those again a little bit later. Uh, 
Inhalant allergy uh, for central compartment was also a requisite for the diagnosis, and that could be established in their series, either through uh, serum or skin prick testing. So the data that we have are, are certainly limited, and uh, there is no level one evidence on this topic. Uh, we do not have RCTs. Uh, we have a, a series of uh, a variety of retrospective series, uh, what a variety of you know, 20, 30 patients up to 100 patients. So the, the data is certainly limited in this condition, uh, but it is of interest. And there's this, this, again, strong association with allergic rhinitis. Asthma seems to be uh, less common in terms of its incidence and prevalence than other subtypes of chronic rhinosinusitis. Uh, most of these patients are never smokers, which is also interesting. Uh, most patients have not had prior attempts at immunotherapy. And if you look at polyp uh, sinus tissue itself, uh, the very limited data that we have suggests that there can be very specific expression of IgE, um, allergen-specific IgE in that tissue. There's an unknown relationship with aspirin, and these are um, not typically associated with either tissue or peripheral eosinophilia. And, and the reasons why they included these uh, different parameters is recognition that we do have other phenotypic entities of chronic sinusitis that are much more well-established, AERD, uh, AFRS, uh, as well as uh, more eosinophilic-driven chronic sinusitis disease. And so they use some of these differentiators to, to try to help separate out and tease out what may be um, more relevant to this condition itself. And so there have been a variety of uh, investigations from the same group, um, as well as uh, some of their, their past graduates that have looked at a variety of topics surrounding this, uh, from the, the, the prevalence of allergy and asthma to the imaging findings. And, and in fact, more most recently, you know, can imaging predict this condition? So you could imagine you're a primary care provider, you have a patient with similar chronic rhinosinusitis or rhinitis symptoms, and you make the decision to obtain imaging, can that imaging itself be a predictor of this condition after you know, subsequent evaluation for inhalant allergy, endoscopy, et cetera? And uh, it seems to be that you know, the imaging is very characteristic, not quite pathognomonic, but uh, very suggestive of this condition. And so there may be a clinical care pathway for this in the future where we partner with primary care providers to consider you know, what an appropriate clinical setting and failures or at least initial attempts of medical therapy, you know, using imaging to be a, a predictor of whether referrals necessary or needed for these patients. But that, you know, that really needs to be further studied and analyzed before that enters into clinical practice. So a couple other key differentiators and observations that uh, these groups uh, have described. Uh, first, direct your attention to the, the left of the screen. And, you know, chronic sinusitis with nasal polyps admittedly is a bit of a generic term, and we're, we're highlighting some of the challenges with that today. But in this table, what they're intending to imply is that it's chronic sinusitis with nasal polyp polyposis that's not the other condition. So they call this NOS in their series, meaning otherwise specified, meaning it was not AFRS, it was not AERD, it was not central compartment. And so for the purposes of this table, that's what they're looking at. And, and specifically, this is looking at the relationship between allergy and the condition itself. And for the chronic sinusitis with nasal polyposis that's not otherwise specified, uh, the, the data suggests there's equivocal evidence uh, regarding the association of inhalant allergy with that condition. Uh, if you look at uh, allergen type, meaning perennial versus seasonal, uh, it, it, the higher associations is not surprisingly with perennial allergens and less with seasonal allergens. Uh, and then central compartment, there seems to be a much stronger association with inhalant allergy. But again, the limitations are we have limited data thus far uh, that really uh, has not, to, you know, I guess, you know, fully proved that. And we're really level three evidence at this point. So we're really looking forward to having RCTs that can further solidify or uh, refute these uh, ideas and concepts. Uh, numerically, uh, from these data uh, on the right side of the screen, you'll see the, the actual numbers that they identified in their series. And so, for example, allergic rhinitis, you know, in AFRS, it's 100% association with inhalant allergy. And that makes sense. Uh, we, we inherently, at least on our side, in nodal laryngology, and I think we follow similar criteria. We use the bet kuhn criteria for this diagnosis, that inhalant allergy to a mold, particularly aspergillus, but can be others, is re requisite for the diagnosis. So it's not surprising in their data set that it's 100% association. Uh, 
the central compartment, they found, you know, 97% towards 98% association with uh, their patients in their series having proven inhalant allergy, um, uh, inhalant allergy on either serum or skin prick testing. Uh, AERID, they found in their series 83% and chronic sinusitis are around 50%, which is consistent with prior reports. Uh, asthma has uh, less associations with central compartment at around 17 to 20%. Uh, whereas, you know, not surprisingly, again, in AERD, it's 100% as part of the, you know, required or requisite diagnosis. So there's, there's a certainly a inherent selection bias that's occurring in these data as part of the diagnostic criteria um, that's um, accounted for here. But in patients that are otherwise not AERD, non-AFRS, the uh, association of asthma with polyp disease, so the NOS category was around 30%, which is you know fairly can, is a little lower than most reports I've seen. Most reports are somewhere around 40 to 50%. But uh, suffice it to say, you know again, what we're highlighting here is the associations really of uh, with central compartment disease. So these patients, in summary, seem to have a much higher concordance rate of inhalant allergy and much less as it relates to asthma. So you know. Uh, this paper was just recently published um, a few months ago, and really it was the first time they looked at their clinical outcomes. So most of the initial papers were really descriptive, trying to really describe, you know, what the presentation was of these patients, you know, common patterns and pathways for initial assessment. And this paper was really the first they really looked at their outcomes. And so, you know, a few years had passed where they could really track these patients' uh, specific outcome measures that we use. So uh, a little background for what we use in otolaryngology, outside of our endoscopy, which we will call, or which we call the Lund-Kennedy endoscopic scoring system, uh, there's a Lund-Mackay system that we use, which is a radiographic uh, scoring and staging system. And then we use a variety of patient reported outcome measures with the most common one you'll likely see with otolaryngologists in general, but certainly with rhinologists are gonna be the SNOT-22. Uh, the previous version, you may have seen this with the SNOT-20. The SNOT-22 was uh, described uh, almost 10 years ago and add psychosocial domains to it. And there's a descriptor for uh, patient report outcome measures that's really common in Europe called the RSDI, which is the Rhinosinusitis Disability Index, less commonly used in the United States, but you may come across that as well too. So suffice it to say, we're, we're using a variety of patient reported outcome measures and objective measures to really follow our patients. Their main outcome measures in this study, which was published in November of 2021, was looking at, you know, what's the risk of polyp recurrence? And then when is it clinically relevant? You know, we often see polyp recurrence in our patients, but the fact that there's recurrence in and of itself does not necessarily mean that there's an action that comes out of that. Uh, there may be some modifications of topical therapies or their medical therapies themselves, but if the patient's symptom burden and their impact on their quality of life is otherwise low, negligible, at a, or an acceptable rate, we may not consider any additional intervention medically or surgically. But the outcome measure they were tracking here is beyond just polyp recurrence, when did the severity of polyps recur that warranted an action, such as revision surgery? And what they found is in compared to other phenotypic entities of chronic sinusitis and central compartment, their rates of polyp recurrence in themselves were lower. The severity of the polyp was also lower when they recurred. And rarely did these patients require revision surgery. They also required less frequent oral antibiotics. Now, they looked at other outcome measures like intranasal corticosteroid use, whether it was spray or rinses, uh, budesonide, or oral steroids. Uh, their, their data was not large enough or robust enough to show uh, or measure a, a difference. Um, so we don't really know, you know, the associations with those medications and interventions. Likely topical steroids uh, have an impact and are of central importance. Likely antihistamine therapy is of importance, at least for symptom control. But if from an outcome measure of polyps, which was their main outcome measure they were interested in, uh, central compartment disease does tend to behave better and perform um, uh, superior to the other uh, phenotypic entities of chronic sinusitis that we're more familiar with. So I'd like to try to put all this together and, and really get to the nuts and bolts of like, how do we consider this in our everyday assessment of patients with chronic sinusitis? Uh, how do we talk to patients about this, counsel them? And what are some of the pathways that we can further assess them when they present to our office, uh, both in your office as well as in ours? And how, do we, how can we share these patients to result in the best possible outcome for our patient? You know, really the cornerstone of all of these patients, whether they're rhinitis or sinusitis patients, really is history. 
you know, the patients really will tell you exactly what is occurring with them and give you really strong indicators of which directions you're going to, to uh, further advance their care. You know, in, in central compartment, they have overlapping features. So you could see that in some patients with, you know, a really strong inhaling allergy history that uh, their sinusitis symptoms are otherwise minimal. Whereas another patient can present with really strong sinusitis symptoms, but when you really press them on, you know, itchiness and sneezing and other more typical um, inhalant allergy symptoms, they, they may be diminishing of those symptoms. So sometimes it can be tricky. Uh, sometimes the, the more directed questions can be really helpful to kind of tease out in our minds. Are we thinking both of these conditions? Are we thinking one of these conditions? And, you know, when in doubt, this is really where uh, partnership with uh, your group is so important that air allergen sensitivity testing for this condition is really a powerful tool and it can give us really interesting clues to, you know, what is our suspicion for this uh, and how do we move forward with uh, further assessment. So I mentioned that one of the main outcome measures that we use is the SNOT-22. Uh, on the right, you'll see the, uh, an actual handout of the SNOT-22. Uh, the SNOT-22 is a 22-item uh, domain test that uh, tracks a variety of subsets within nose and sinus conditions. A uh, quick glance, you also see that there's other subdomains that we track, you know, ear symptoms, uh, sleep quality, uh, productivity, concentration, as well as psychosocial domains. And so we are tracking the impacts of these conditions beyond uh, the typical nose and sinus symptoms. Uh, and we, uh, what's been established is this is uh, such a, a widely used and uh, well-studied uh, outcome measure that we have really good sense of their minim minimal clinical important difference to so the MCID uh, on this, uh, which also gives us really a great threshold for understanding really the impacts on patients. And so the MCID is 10. And so, you know, patients really that have a SNOT 22 score greater than 20, you know, that's going to be a really good predictor that this patient has clinically relevant chronic sinusitis. Where we first begin in our offices, in your office, is an anterior rhinoscopy. And it can be challenging in these patients because oftentimes the turbinates are hypertrophied or the anterior nasal cavity can be edematous to really give you a good sense further posteriorly what's occurring perhaps in the middle medial space or for further posteriorly in the nasal cavity itself. So th this really will highlight some of the power of endoscopy and how we can really try to like assess those areas in a more rigorous way that understand the impacts that are beyond what we can see just on anterior endoscopy. Their treatment response history can be informative as well. You know, many of these patients will initially have started with uh, their primary providers or over-the-counter uh, uh, treatment strategies. So many patients will have started with, you know, nasal saline or intranasal corticosteroids, likely some oral antihistamines. Uh, I'm sure what many of you find is a common experience that I see is uh, that their treatment duration or compliance uh, was not optimal. And therefore, it can be challenging to understand what was truly a failure of medical therapy uh, versus what was just a not optimal treatment strategy. So uh, we, we certainly make sure we go deeper into that and really understand what they did, how long they did it. Uh, was it you know proper trial of those therapies before we uh, call them a failure of those interventions? So uh, I'd like to go a little deeper in endoscopy and imaging is that this is really what is our um, you know, bread and butter for us, and this is our every day, is really going deeper into the using these two tools to objectify, you know, not only whether they have inflammation or paranasal sinuses, but I'm also interested in what's the extent, you know, what is involving in terms of the paranasal sinuses and what is it not, in as much as uh, the severity thereof. It gives me further clues into their underlying anatomy and really, you know, sets the stage for one, is it chronic sinusitis or not? but also you know, give me a real good sense of, you know, the expression of their condition and other features that may guide, you know, further interventions such as surgery. So endoscopy, you know, when you refer patients to otolaryngology, you know, many of these patients are gonna receive endoscopy. I, I do wanna highlight briefly that there are different forms of endoscopy and they have advantages and, and disadvantages. So what is very common in many otolaryngology practices is what you see on the left, which is a flexible endoscopy. Uh, the flexible endoscopy is, uh, you know, a, a mechanism where we can easily avail, evaluate the nasal cavity, the nasal pharynx, and the upper airway. It's a really great one-size-fits-all tool, and it has a, a really powerful diagnostic uh, utility in our practices as own laryngologists. One of the limitations, however, for this is that we have to, it requires us to use two hands to do this assessment. 
And so when it comes to sampling mucus or taking cultures or doing biopsies, uh, this is not a tool that uh, lends to that type of uh, set further assessment or intervention. So it's a powerful diagnostic tool, but that's really the end of that tool. Uh, it, the, the images on these are a little bit more grainy. Uh, there are versions of these that have a, what's called a distal chip at the end of them that give us a high definition view. So if you share or send patients to our laryngology uh, colleagues in the community, you may see when they do these assessments of the, uh, the larynx and the vocal folds, that they have these really crisp high fidelity images and that's because they're using a little different flexible endoscope. The one that we tend to use as rhinologists are, is gonna be what you see on screen right. And these are rigid endoscopes. So uh, the ones that most rhinologists will use are a pediatric uh, endoscope. They're 2.9 millimeters. They come at a variety of different angles that you see there. So on, on the endoscope itself, you'll see a variety of numbers, zero, 30, 45, and 70. And that's the angle of the, the uh, the, uh, the bezel at the end of the endoscope that is allowing us to see in different angulations in the sinuses. As we all know, the sinuses are these cryptic cavernous spaces and there's a lot of turns and corners and areas that are, can be difficult to assess when we're using a single portal, meaning the nasal cavity or the nostril to visualize these spaces. So we use a variety of angled endoscopes to do this and it allows us to see around corners, around spaces, around polyps, wherever we need to go. But perhaps more importantly, it also is an instrument that's driven by a single hand. And that gives us a second hand for suction, for biopsies, for cultures, for debridements that you may see that your, your patients that have had sinus surgery with us get you know, serial debridements after their procedure itself. So it's a really powerful tool. And I'd argue that um, it's probably the most common tool that you'll see, uh, particularly rhinologists, but most otolaryngologists you are, are developing uh, in their practice or are already using. Uh, this is kind of our typical room setup for endoscopy. So if you're sending a patient to us, this is what you can kind of share with them what to expect. This is probably the area that we get the most questions from patients is about endoscopy, both and just like, is it going to hurt? Is it uncomfortable? How's it done? Uh, how do you, how long does it take? But also, you know, implications as it relates to billing, you know, endoscopy is considered a procedure. And so this is something that we uh, submit for billing on a separate purpose. So we have a professional fee and then we have our a procedure fee for this. So patients do get additional uh, charges uh, submitted to their insurance for this. And it can be expensive. You know, nasal endoscopy can be several hundred dollars to a thousand dollars for just a diagnostic exam. So what we do in uh, at UW is we do send a letter to all patients prior to them coming to our clinic that details that this is an additional charge that they will see to their insurers that it's uh, gonna be a procedure charge and uh, therefore to anticipate that these types of charges may be coming through their insurance. So we, we certainly take stock of that as we're assessing patients that uh, we're evaluating in our clinic that recognizes there are costs to this uh, and making sure that we're using it properly, judiciously and, and indicated uh, that's providing us important pieces of information and further directing their care, uh, both in the assessment, but also in the treatment phases of it. Uh, in terms of the procedure itself, it, it does not take long to do this, particularly in an established clinic like a rhinology clinic where this is, you know, most of our patients in a given day are going to receive endoscopy. Uh, so it, on average can only, you know, usually only takes about a minute or two to do this procedure. We anesthetize the nose uh, with uh, two, two agents, so uh, oxymetazoline and then lidocaine. lidocaine. Uh, most patients tolerate this quite well. Most patients might feel the endoscope in the tip of their nose, but otherwise it's fairly comfortable. Um, sometimes it can be a little uncomfortable with uh, the septum is really particularly where patients will notice some sensitivities to it. Uh, some patients may feel like they're sneezing or, or uh, just a little irritated from the scope inside their nose. Uh, rarely patients will have a vagal response. And so we you know, if, if that happens, we certainly navigate that and, and walk them through that process of how we can recover from that. But by and large, most patients tolerate this quite well. I think what's been really helpful is what you'll notice on the picture on the left is that we have a screen on the wall. And so that allows the patients to watch their endoscopy real time. So the, the setup in the room is you can kind of see on screen right, which is uh, this is one of my partners, Mark Whipple, who uh, kindly volunteered to be a, a model for this uh, video that I'll show here in a moment. But uh, we have the patient in this position. We can see we have the left hand stabilizing the scope and the right hand on the scope. This is uh, one of our uh, chief residents that was demonstrating this and you'll see in a video in a moment. 
but uh, with increased uh, use of this and in becoming more facile, it really becomes a single hand uh, endoscopy procedure, which again allows us to do and have the right hand free for um, any other additional assessment. So this is kind of what it looks like from the patient experience. So again, we're watching the monitor behind the patient. Uh, you can see we're using a rigid endoscope. You'll see at the end of the rigid endoscope, there's this little box with a cord. That's the camera that gets attached to the tower that allows us to not only magnify our visualization, but record it. We can document for subsequent uh, offline reviewing, uh, reference for their, their condition. So we record all of our endoscopies at UW and that, and that allows us really to help you know re refer back in clinical care, but also facilitates our research enterprise. And so this is just showing you know, the left nasal cavity, what you see on the, uh, the video screen, and that's the middle meatal space. There's a little bit of a septal deviation into the middle meatus. And when you look at the patient, you know, I, I granted this is an otolaryngologist that knows what to expect and they're primed for this type of experience. Mark's nose was unanesthetized. Uh, so I, I, I certainly understand that, you know, he's familiar and experienced with this and understands what's going to happen. So there's, that's a, a really important part of this and how we coach and counsel patients. But the reality is most patients can tolerate it quite well. In a patient with central compartment disease, you know, their endoscopy is going to look a little bit different. So this is a, an endoscopy in somebody that has rhinitis, allergic rhinitis, but does not have chronic sinusitis or central compartment. And what you'll notice, this is the right side of the nose. This is a rigid endoscope. It's a 30 degree endoscope. I'm now coming into the posterior compartment of the nasal cavity into the nasopharynx. And this is looking into the nasopharynx. And in the nasopharynx, you can see the palate moving. You see a little bit of mucus. The, the, cope, the scope is now turned up towards the sphenoethmoid recess. So right in the center of the uh, visual field is where the sphenoid sinus is draining down into the nasal cavity. You're seeing the edge of the middle turbinate. And then we'll kind of pull the scope back out, looking at a variety of different meatal spaces. So you see middle turbinate, you see superior turbinate high in the endoscopic field. And again, we're looking at all these different meatal spaces in the nasal cavity. So one of the things I talk to patients about is when that, they're having this exam, you know, conceptually think about that you're having your exam, you know, in this hallway, which is the nasal cavity, and we're trying to look in the doors that lead into these spaces, the sinuses. This is a patient with central compartment disease, and you'll notice it's a striking difference. There's all of this edema. This is on the middle turbinate. There's uh, polypoid change. There's polyp. There's thickened mucus. And very different endoscopic findings. This is the left side of the patient's nasal cavity than on the patient we just saw previously. So I'll play that one more time. This is central compartment. So again, left side, this is the inferior turbinate. You see a polyp extending down into the nasal cavity up along the middle turbinate. So it's extending down off the middle turbinate, down into the nasal cavity, medial to the inferior turbinate. There's all this associated thick and mucus. Now, when you meet this patient, we meet this patient, you meet this patient, you may not know this is central compartment. What you know is that there's a polyp in the nose. So that will lead into further assessment with imaging to further characterize and subtype this patient to that phenotypic entity. I mentioned that one of the main outcome measures that we use is the endoscopy outcome measure called the Lund Kennedy Endoscopic Scoring System. So when you see or you send patients to our group, you often see report backs where we'll put in our endoscopy findings, the Lund, Con Lund Kennedy Endoscopic Scoring System. This is a validated um, endoscopic scoring system that does have correlations with patients' symptoms and their outcomes. But that'll be an interesting caveat. We'll come to the radiographic scoring system in just a moment and how those two differ. But there's five main things we track on this outcome measure, polyps, edema, discharge, crusting, and scarring. And the scarring was added to follow patients post-surgery. So this is a patient you're seeing for you know, they've had two surgeries in the 80s or the 90s. They're coming back with polyps. Uh, and it really helps us get a sense of, you know, what's the extent of scarring? Is it minimal? Is it moderate? Is it severe? Where is the scarring? You know, scarring in the nasal cavity is less significant to me than it is, you know, high in, for, for example, the outflow of the frontal sinus. That's going to be more problematic. So how do we, as surgeons, particularly think about that is much like we're talking about polyps, that one size doesn't fit all, that there are going to be different expressions and severities of this in both its uh, the quantity, the size, but also in the location. So this scoring system use a, is, uses a numeric uh, qualifiers or quantifiers from zero, one, and two. And we go through and systematically score their, their sinus findings uh, according to the, the, the table that's listed below.
Now, imaging is really an interesting topic, and this has evolved quite a bit over the years. And, you know, plain films, uh, I'm going to cut to the chase, they're out. We don't use them. So plain films are, are no utility in the assessment of patients with chronic sinusitis. Uh, they have poor sensitivity. They have poor specificity. They don't provide detailed anatomic information for us as surgeons. They do not permit a surgical navigation if the patient would go on for surgery. Uh, there, there's a, a host of myriad of couple, or challenges when they're even obtained. Uh, there's certain parameters they have to follow of how many feet they have to be away from the, the, uh, the, uh, the x-ray machine itself and how the head is tilted and turned and it, it introduces a, a lot of problems. Uh, so this is out. This is a, actually a recommendation against from our professional society for the use of plain films and the assessment of nose and sinus conditions. So plain films are out. But CTs are certainly the mainstay and do the heavy lifting. We do not use MRIs for the assessment of chronic sinusitis. So CT is our study modality of choice, uh, particularly a non-contrasted CT. So this is great. It's widely available. It's typically low cost. It's widely covered by insurances. Medicare doesn't require any prior authorization for uh, CT scans. Most of the commercial insurers do require prior authorization, but not all. Uh, so that's something we, we typically look at, but these are, you know, there's increased sensitivity to radiation dose exposure, meaning cumulative exposure. So most imaging centers around the country now have low dose radiation uh, protocols in place. There is often this misconception that a CT must be significant radiation exposure to the patient. That's just not true with the current our models and algorithms they're using. And uh, so therefore that there's a lot of distinct advantages to this. A CT scan on average costs a few hundred dollars for both the scan and interpretation. So overall it's a, uh, you know, it's a mild to moderate cost for, for the healthcare system, but it is distinctly wide avail widely available. And again, it does not require contrast agents for the initial assessment of chronic sinusitis. If you see us order additional imaging uh, such as MRI or additional CT scans, it's you know, if we have concerns for disease beyond the sinuses, so this would be, you know, encephalocele's or eye involvement, brain involvement, and where you see us order additional CT scans, it's usually in surgical planning, and, and I'll come to that in just a moment. But let's talk about it in the context of central compartment con uh, condition. And what I mentioned is that central compartment seems to have a very uh, specific, typified, characterized uh, pattern of inflammation as seen on a CT scan. So on, on the far left, you'll see an axial view and you see evidence of inflammation in the ethmoid air cells. So the word we often use is a pacification and you may see partial, total, complete as a qualifiers to that uh, expression of inflammation. In the middle is the coronal, representative coronal view. And you can see what's important to this condition is that we have inflammation within the ethmoid air cells, but not complete. It's you know partial to maybe moderate to severe, but certainly not complete to pacification. But the maxillary is relatively spare. There's certainly some mucosal thickening in the floor of the maxillary sinuses, but the remainder of the maxillary sinus is otherwise you know, free of infl significant inflammation. And it's fairly well aerated. If you look on the far right in the representative sagittal view, the frontal sinus itself is well aerated. The sphenoid sinus has mucosal thickening, but the concentration of this problem is really within the ethmoid air cells in this middle meatal space. And that is a very characteristic pattern seen in this phenotypic entity of, of chronic sinusitis. This is distinctly different than our patients with AERD. It's different than our patients with AFRS, specifically AFRS. AFRS is gonna have a very different uh, radiographic paradigm and is part of the diagnostic criteria for AFRS. And so this is a very distinct um, pattern than those conditions. So this is a patient of mine that has a central compartment from a few years ago, and this is a coronal non-contrasted CT, just moving from anterior to posterior. And the screen grabs that I showed it in the previous slide are from this same patient. So this is the entire scan. And you can see again, sphenoid sinuses look relatively healthy. The frontal sinuses themselves look relatively healthy. Um, and, and including the maxillary sinuses. So there's this distinct concentration of disease within the ethmoid air cells. There is inflammation in the frontal outflow itself, and there is within the, the entryway into the sphenoid sinus. But the, the story is that the sinuses themselves are for the most part spared with the exception of the ethmoid air cells. So I mentioned that times you may see us order additional CT scans, and really that's in an effort for surgical planning. And the reason why we do that is we use this technology called surgical navigation. 
And so if you haven't seen surgical navigation, this is just a couple of representative screen grabs of what it may look or what it does look like for us. And this is probably the most common system that's used, which is a, a big you know, company that makes this electromagnetic surgical navigation. So what happens uh, briefly is that your imaging data, your CT imaging data is uh, input into this navigation system. And the navigation system then can uh, use all three surgical planes, so uh, coronal, sagittal, and axial, to recreate this capacity for our surgical instruments to be cross-referenced with the radiographic anatomy. Think of it as GPS, and it's GPS for us during sinus surgery. One of the limitations of this are, are few. One is that the data set, the input, is it needs to be of high quality. So it, this is where you often see us order 0.6 millimeter scans uh, with a couple different qualifiers on the parameters of how the technologist will require it. And that's because the input to this machine requires that. Additionally, this is a static set of images. So as surgery is progressing, our map hasn't been updated. So that's one of the, the, the challenges we have as surgeons is that as we're progressing through a sinus surgery, our GPS, our map, is based on the pre-surgical anatomy. So as we operate, the, there's a divergence that occurs between the reality, the actual surgical anatomy, and where we started at the beginning of surgery. But you know that's unfortunately a common pitfall that you know a variety of groups are looking for solutions at, but it does not yet exist. So the input is really the, the important part I want to stress today because that is you know something why you see us order additional scans. It's not necessarily because we're looking for more diagnostic information. Sometimes that's true. But a lot of times it's really for surgical planning purposes, meaning the surgical navigation. So let's get back to central compartment. Uh, we had kind of talked about the characteristic endoscopy findings and imaging findings. What are some initial treatment strategies? It's a bit of a busy slide, but they're things that are very familiar to our groups. And many times, you know, primary providers have started some form of many of these before they even refer on to our groups for additional assessment and evaluation. Not surprisingly, it's very, you know, common pathways for initial management of rhinitis and sinusitis conditions. Uh, prednisone is an interesting topic for us. It's an evolving topic for us. Uh, our most recent clinical uh, uh, consensus statement uh, helped guide our decisions for prednisone in that patients with polyps prednisone is a recommendation, uh, but in patients without polyps, it's considered an option in therapy, which is a bit of a change from, you know, even 10 years ago. And so we're beginning a little bit more selective in the use of systemic corticosteroids, but uh, this is a group of patients you certainly could consider prednisone. I have what I use. Uh, I use it uh, this uh, manner to really be mindful of the total dose of corticosteroids. Uh, it turns out that for otolaryngologists, the, the number one um, source of litigation for us is prednisone or systemic corticosteroids. So uh, much, much like many groups in medicine, we're very sensitive and, and keen to the, the total dose that we're delivering to patients, prescribing to patients for uh, you know, non-life-threatening conditions. And so uh, this is the typical algorithm that a lot of rhinologists may use. There's other iterations, of course, and variants to this, but some form of tapering dose of prednisone would be a consideration. Uh, our clinical practice statement also has a recommendation towards uh, macrolides and tetracyclines or doxycycline as initial uh, antibiotic considerations in sinusitis. So patients with polyps, antibiotics are considered an option. I'll tell you that uh, the bit of a challenge, however, though, is many of the insurers want to see that patients have been on antibiotics. So although our medical literature is more biased towards this as an option in treatment. It's, it's in reality a, a, a common pathway for patients to go through, particularly as they trend towards uh, authorization for surgical procedures. In the United States, azithromycin tends to have the most data supporting its use for chronic sinusitis uh, in Europe, a tetracycline and doxycycline view. Um, in my mind, I'm not aware of any study that shows superiority of one over the other, so I tend to default to either one of these. I do screen for heart arrhythmia, um, for patients on azithromycin or macrolides. Uh, and if there's any concerns of that, then I, I pivot towards uh, doxycycline in particular in my practice. So much like chronic sinusitis, when patients have fail uh, appropriate medical therapy, uh, then surgery is considered an option. Uh, going back to appropriate medical therapy for chronic sinusitis, uh, our uh, clinical consensus statement requires three things. Uh, and this also informs the insurance for authorizations for surgery. It's a, a month of saline irrigations, a month of intranasal corticosteroids, whether it's sprays or irrigations, and some form of additional medical therapy that's systemic, either prednisone and antibiotics. Or if it's polyps, you could consider just prednisone without oral antibiotics. And if it's a non-polyp patient, 
oral antibiotics, but prednisone is an option. So there's a little bit of nuance to that. And it does at times become a little bit more complex from the payer's perspective outside of the medical guidelines. So that's uh, what we now call appropriate medical therapy. Uh, the term maximal medical therapy has been uh, ushered to, to history for our group. And the reason for that is maximal medical therapy really implied that every patient needs to receive saline, nasal steroids, oral prednisone, oral antibiotics, you know, oral antihistamines and so forth and so on. And, and there's a real thrust for us to be more selective and recognition that we're describing with more granularity, these phenotypes and even the underlying endotypes and the mechanisms involved. So I think you're gonna continue from our group in otolaryngology to see more and more of that as we get a little bit more selective over time in recognition of the underlying mechanisms of these conditions. But if there's medical failure, that's where surgery is an option for these patients in central compartment disease. And um, you know, it, it's not widely accepted of what's the best practice after surgery for these patients or necessarily you know, what we struggle with is what's the proper extent of surgery for these patients. And uh, those are some of the things that, you know, probably need to be individualized and talked with the patient about advantages and disadvantages of how much surgery we do. Uh, and then what does the aftercare look like after the surgery itself? I would argue that most patients require some form of an intranasal steroid and intranasal antihistamine. You could probably debate whether that's a, a irrigation-based delivery method or an atomizer-based delivery method or a spray. Uh, there's probably uh, advantages and disadvantages to all of those. Uh, I think our group certainly has a bias towards irrigation-based delivery methods. Uh, they're overall um, inexpensive for most patients. They are well tolerated. They have uh, data supporting their practice, and they're you know the neti pot is very familiar to a lot of patients. Although we tend to use the squeeze bottle as opposed to the pot itself. So um, I think, you know, that's, that's what you'll see most of our patients use is particularly budesonide. And then uh, ketodafin was the initial kind of uh, area that uh, Drew and I and Lahari started using about five years ago. And we've started to evolve and azelastine uh, went off patent. And so that is now available. And so you often see uh, our patients on ketodafin and budesonide. And we're actively uh, in a study right now, uh, further looking at those uh, outcomes and uh, and the use of, for all patients with chronic sinusitis that have AR associated with it. So uh, again, back to this diagnostic endoscopy I showed just a little bit ago in our central compartment patient. And uh, this patient uh, unfortunately did fail medical therapies. And so ultimately went on for surgery. And, you know, again, the medical therapies were those that we highlighted previously. Uh, this is what the patient looked like six months after surgery. So left-sided nasal endoscopy, rigid exam, we're in the nasal cavity. We're seeing much less edema, no polyps, no thickened mucus. Now coming up into the left maxillary sinus, ethmoid cavity, and sphenoid sinus. Uh, you see a little bit of thin, clear mucus, but certainly no polyps. Now taking that 30 degree camera, I'm gonna look up along the ethmoid skull base. This is now on the orbit right there. There's the ethmoid skull base in the center of the field, and then up into the frontal sinus. And then you'll see the frontal sinus here in just a moment. And there's looking up into the frontal sinus itself. And there's zero polyps in this patient's nose. They were on budesonide irrigations at the 0.5 milligram dosing. So 0.5 and 240 mLs of nasal saline BID dosing was what this patient was on. Uh, there's not 22, uh, it was well below uh, the MCID. You know, we talked about being below 20 uh, and had felt quite well. And ultimately they were uh, released from my clinic uh, for uh, a subsequent follow-up later on. Um, so these patients do tend to do really well uh, with uh, surgery as well as uh, additional topical therapies. That patient did not have immunotherapy. Uh, and that's probably a different discussion based on their, you know, other symptoms that they may or may not be experiencing. Uh, and certainly as a consideration in all of these patients is, is the utility and role of immunotherapy. Um, and I think that would be a great area for us to consider partnering on in terms of that, those types of efforts, but also research. So in summary, uh, central compartment appears to be a distinct phenotype that has very characteristic clinical patterns. So based on their history um, and its associations with allergic rhinitis, very uh, uh, stereotypical endoscopic and imaging findings. Uh, treatment for this are similar to both allergic rhinitis and CRS. Immunotherapy certainly could be considered in these patients. And I would argue if they haven't been assessed for inhalant allergy, they need to be assessed for inhalant allergy. Uh, and there certainly is a role for surgery and topical therapies, as we mentioned.
Um, our, our group, uh, we have two centers, uh, sites of practice. Uh, so UW Montlake and then over Eastside Specialty Center. Our group has changed uh, quite a bit in the last few years. So I just want to introduce my partners if you haven't uh, heard or met them before. Uh, of screen left is uh, Ari Jafari. He joined us about 18 months ago. Uh, he completed his fellowship at Harvard. And then screen right is uh, Walid Abizade, who joined us uh, just coming in two years ago, and he did fellowship at Stanford. And so he's also leading our uh, rhinology research. And so uh, uh, there's a group of us three uh, that are doing this work, and uh, we, we have a fellowship. So we also have uh, uh, currently uh, Nathan Reeve is our fellow. And so uh, we're here to partner with you and serve you. And if there's anything I can do to help you, I've included my cell phone number here. Please feel free to call me. Uh, or email me, whatever is your preferred method of connection. Uh, we'd love to continue to partner with uh, this group. And it's truly been one of the most rewarding aspects of my career and one of the parts that I look forward to the most. So thanks, thank you again for uh, all your partnership and patient cares. It's truly appreciated and valued and I know our patients do as well. So thank you again. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Ian, um, you hear me? I can, thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, three quick questions. One is central compartment, just a new term for ethmoid sinus disease. Two, what's the role of biologics? And three, you told us that antibiotics were part of the therapy, but there was no evidence this was an infectious disease. Yeah, great questions. Um, so I, I don't think it's just a new term for ethmoid sinusitis. You know, again, you have to have polyps to be uh, qualified for this diagnosis. Um, to be fair, you will also see patients that have expression of the polyps medial to the middle turbinate that's coming out from the space we call the olfactory cleft, and the ethmoid themselves is spared. Now, what can happen sometimes is that polyp expression or volume can increase to a significant degree where it displaces the middle turbinate laterally. And then the ethmoids can become secondarily inflamed, but it's not the primary disease process. It's a, it's a consequence of an anatomic disruption from the burden of polyp disease. So even within this entity that's being described, there appears to be differences in the expression and presentation of the polyps themselves. So I, I wouldn't necessarily call it just a different form of ethmoid sinusitis. It certainly can present that way as the patient I showed, which was really expression within the ethmoid air cells. This lead author for this group is a rhinologist named John Delgadio down at Emory. And he's, he really just recently wrote a commentary in one of our leading journals about the deposition of inhalant allergies in the nose. And that, you know, we should perhaps be cautious removing the middle turbinate during surgery because we may allow inhalant allergens to deposit in deeper areas within the paranasal sinuses. So initially we may improve the patient outcome, but in the long term we may be harming them. So there's some evolving ideas and thoughts on this that haven't yet been really mapped out or proven. But uh, I think that's it's a good question and, uh, you know, we just need to have further data to really understand that. In terms of biologics, I don't know. I have, I really don't know. There's no data supporting the use of biologics necessarily in this specific subtype. I suspect in the uh, biologics clinical trials, there were patients like this in it, uh, just because again, it, it tends to be this heterogeneous group that kind of gets labeled as chronic sinusitis with nasal polyps, but in reality, they, there are subtypes and differences within those patients. So it may be that there is a role and utility for, you know, uh, biologic therapy, particularly dupixent. Um, but, you know, dupilumab, you know, the interesting part of it is that these patients, if, if we go back to the data I presented, they have low rates of polyp recurrence, they have high rates of symptom control, and they have low risks of needing revision surgery. So this may not be a patient that we'd even, even if we could, or we said, you know, if they actually meet the criteria for authorization, this may not be the patient where the cost benefit is really there to even consider dupilumab. Uh, or if it's a, you know, omalizumab, maybe you know, that'd be, that'd be maybe an interesting question for omalizumab, but uh, I'm not aware of any data that has looked at that yet. So it's probably another really interesting area for, for inquiry that would be helpful. In terms of antibiotics, you know, azithromycin and doxycycline, you know, uh, really this was borrowed from other areas within medicine, particularly like dermatology, for example, has used, you know, tetracyclines for a long period of time for treatment of acne because of its anti-inflammatory properties. And so the, the, the hypothesis, the thought, the idea is that these medications, macrolides and tetracyclines really were leveraging more anti-inflammatory properties than antimicrobial properties. Uh, 
And so that's the rationale, at least in our consensus statements, to use those over Augment and Bactrim, Cipro, et cetera. All right, we've got uh, not much time, but any other pressing questions? Speak up or forever hold your peace. <laughs> Well, thank you for uh, updating us on this uh, evolving topic um, with the increasing complexity each year. So we'll look forward to next year's update. Um, it, it clearly is an opportunity to be doing some mechanistic studies and looking for eosinophilia and biopsies and uh, to, to really nail this down more precisely. Um, and we'll look for that data to be coming. All right. Yeah, uh, I, see, I completely, oh. I completely agree. I mean, I, I think I, the interest in this is that this is a common problem. 